Coming up on Unpeeled, Neverland is nowhere to be found in this new horror franchise. Time may be tick-tocking for this popular social media platform. And get your brackets ready, because we're breaking down all the madness. And the Bachelor Nation is on fire in more ways than one. All that and more, Unpeeled starts right now. Welcome to a brand new episode of Unpeeled. I'm Lily Evans. And I'm Charlie Goldberg. Now for a news story on a Nickelodeon producer. Quiet On Set is a four-part documentary that details Nickelodeon producer Dan Schneider's alleged abuse. The documentary, which was released on Sunday, met with people who worked under Schneider so they could tell their side of the story. Many recounted stories of abuse, terror, and unsafe working conditions that stem from Schneider's behavior. He spoke out in a YouTube interview yesterday saying, quote, I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. In other news, Dylan Mulvaney released her first single titled Days of Girlhood, sparking major controversy online. Some users claim that the lyrics degrade womanhood, only highlighting the cliches of being a woman. Yeah, others have stated the hatred towards the song stems from transphobia. Mulvaney commented on the remark saying that the song is about her own experience as a trans woman. She also said she was just, just trying to have fun and keep the topic lighthearted. And from music to TV, Super Bowl champion Travis Kelsey is currently in talks to be the host of the Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader reboot. The show, which plans to air on Amazon Prime Video, will have celebrity guests instead of children as the lifeline. This wouldn't be Kelsey's first TV appearance as he was already on a reality dating show called Catching Kelsey in 2016. If he does agree to a deal, fans have sure questions about his football career. Now, Lily, a lot of these football players transitioned from the field to being on-air personalities. You see Terry Crews, now the host of America's Got Talent. You see Mr. Michael Strahan now on Good Morning America regularly. This is a pattern that works. Absolutely. And I mean, Travis Kelsey has a lot of fans, both sports fans and not. And I think he has to credit that to his very mainstream relationship that he has with Taylor Swift. I mean, he has the Swifties on his side now, and that is a massive group of people that would love to see him on TV. Absolutely. Talk about mainstream there with the Swiftie army having your back. But the show itself is also exciting that's coming back. I was a big fan of it. But I wasn't a fan of how smart these fifth graders are, making me feel not that educated, Lily. <laughs> no, I completely agree. But it is a really nostalgic and fun show, and I think they're putting more of a modern twist on it. And having Travis Kelsey host this show, compared to just some other random celebrity, I feel like is really going to up the views. Absolutely. Well, we can't wait to see if it comes out and if he hosts. Sticking in the world of television, the popular video game Among Us is becoming an animated series. CBS Studios announced that they will develop the show with Owen Dennis, who also created and wrote Infinity Train and Regular Show. The series has been in development since June of 2023. Cast members revealed so far include Elijah Wood, Randall Park, Ashley Johnson, and Yvette Nicole Brown. These actors will all play different characters from the game, which is centered around crewmates trying to repair a damaged spaceship. The release date of the show is yet to be determined. Now, Charlie, I can't help but wonder if Hollywood writers are kind of running out of ideas. I feel like this is a really popular theme that I'm seeing in Hollywood with writers just kind of taking these already created concepts and characters and just kind of repurposing them to fit for the big screen. Well, I have to disagree with you there. I don't think it's writers running out of ideas necessarily. I think it's writers noticing the video game pattern of turning them into TV shows working out pretty well in the box office. You know, The Last of Us was a huge hit on HBO Max. And we also have Minecraft, the video game, turning into a movie with Jack Black as the star. All that makes writers say, you know what? Let's repackage this. Let's repurpose it. It's going to work out in their favor. I mean, maybe it's just because I'm not a huge video game fan that I'm not as excited for these movies, but I gotta say, there are a lot of big names, a lot of really prominent actors attached to them, so that really piques my interest and makes me want to watch. Yeah, now here's my issue with the show really fast, the fact that this is gonna be a series, not a movie. Not enough material coming from, you know, a very popular video game with right. millennials to be a whole series, but I guess we have to wait and find out. Absolutely. Moving on from video games to the big screen, the creators of the film Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey have announced a twisted childhood cinematic universe. Jagged Edge Productions and ITN Studios released a line of their planned releases. The universe includes terrifying films about even more Disney favorites, including Bambi, Pinocchio, and Peter Pan. 
All these standalone films lead to a character team up in Pooniverse, Monsters Assemble. Director of Blood and Honey, Reese Frake Waterfield, says that he is inspired by the Avengers and that, quote, would love to see a horror movie where the villains group together and are going after their survivors. Pooniverse Monsters Assemble is set to release in 2025. Now, Charlie, call me sick Sounds and crazy. twisted, but I am so excited for this. Like, I think people of our generation that grew up with these original tales will really appreciate having, you know, a darker, more adult version of the story. Absolutely. And you saw my transfixed face mm -hmm. a couple moments ago. Yes. I love horror, and I'm just, you know, so glad that they're really expanding on this crazy, crazy, crazy concept, making it into a whole universe. And I'm pleasantly shocked to see this coming out. No, absolutely. I think it is going to be so exciting. However, I'm not sure how Disney is going to feel about it. They've worked really hard to create a very wholesome, family-oriented brand that's been around for a long time. And I just can't imagine that they'll want to see, you know, horror movies with their characters. And here's another issue that might stem out of this. You know, the big Winnie the Pooh universe, Pooniverse, <laughs> the big Avengers payoff movie like mm -hmm. that is coming out mm -hmm. in 2025, meaning they're going to make a whole boatload of movies mm -hmm. in just a calendar year. Yeah. They might be rushed when it comes to making all these films. No, that's a good point. I mean, you think about making a multitude of films in one year when most movies, movies are made in one year. So that's, it's going to be interesting. We'll have to see. Oh, yeah. And after the break, we might be saying goodbye to one of the most popular apps. And we're catching you up on all things royal. All that and more after the break. took over my bedroom. Come on, come on. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. Ah! Dad! You saved me. Dad? Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Whether it's watching movie clips, recipe videos, or dance trends, we've all been sucked into the world of TikTok before. But will this come to an end soon? Here to elaborate on all that and TikTok potentially being banned is our industry reporter, Riley Lucetta. Thank you, Charlie. Congress has issued a bill that TikTok will be removed from American app stores and web services or sold to another company, specifically in the United States. Let's talk about why. TikTok is owned by BitDance, a Chinese company. Our government fears BitDance having information about the 170 million American app utilizers. BitDance CEO Shouzi Chu has expressed fr frustration to the, this accusal. As he states, BitDance has never shared any private information in the past. The bill has made its way through the House approval. President Biden addressed the bill, stating that if it ended up on his desk, he would sign it. The question remains, will the Senate approve it? And what would happen next? TikTok being off the market would benefit platforms such as Instagram and Facebook Reels. If they do sell, BitDance has a specific addictive algorithm that they would not be willing to share with other buying companies. Would things ever be the same? L last year, the app was valued at $200 billion. 
companies such as Meta or Microsoft would be unable to acquire TikTok due to Biden's administration's work against the monopolization of tech industries. Many influencers spoke out about the potential TikTok ban. Here's what beauty guru James Charles had to say. It's the dumbest that I ever heard. Makes me so mad beyond belief. We are starving, people are dying, people are in jail for marijuana charges. We're in a war that we should not be in in the first place. And TikTok is our most pressing concern? I don't think so. It's also infuriating. James Charles raises a good point. Why is this our main concern? How much of a t potential threat is TikTok really to our cybersecurity? Personally, I think with Biden's verbal endorsement and the House's quick approval, the bill will be passed. As for what will happen next, it will be interesting to see what app begins to rise. I think Instagram Reels will make a comeback. What do you think, Lily? Uh, I don't know, Riley. Instagram Reels are not really my thing, so I'm going to miss TikTok a lot. Well, last week was a big week for the royal family in the media as Kate Middleton continued to spark headlines for an editing mishap. Meghan Markle also came into the spotlight with the announcement of a new business venture. Our lifestyle reporter Sophie, Sophia Zaninovich and pop culture reporter Julia Bossis are here to tell us more. So lovely to have you two beautiful girls here. I'm so excited to talk about this. I love anything royal drama. We're so excited. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, what can you tell us about Meghan Markle's new company? Yeah, so Prince Harry's wife, Meghan Markle, has announced her new business venture. It's called the American Riviera Orchard. Who knows what that is? <laughs> no one, actually. So the announcement was her first post in nearly four years on her Instagram, which is crazy. Um, and we can tell it's a lifestyle and kitchen brand so far. Um, in the video that she posted, it's her arranging flowers and walking around what appears to be her Southern California home. And when she was asked to comment on it, she gives no information as to what the brand is so far. Um, but if you check the American Riviera Orchards in, or Instagram and website, all you'll find is the really fancy logo and an email sign up to get notifications in the future. So I guess we'll just have to sign up to see. Huh, that is so interesting, yeah. keeping it mysterious. Well, speaking of the royal family, Julia, what can you tell us about the updates surrounding Kate Middleton? Absolutely. So on March 10th, which was Mother's Day in the UK, the Kensington Palace distributed a photo on Instagram of Kate with her three children that was reportedly taken by Prince William earlier that week. However, soon after the photo was posted, many people started noticing that the photo appeared to be altered. And several major news agencies actually withdrew the image, saying there was evidence of photo manipulation. Now, um, the following Monday, Middleton came out with a statement herself saying, like many amateur photographers, I occasionally experiment with evidence editing. editing. Um, now this comes after months of speculation regarding Kate and her whereabouts since she allegedly went underwent abdominal surgery back in January. Oh, so interesting. I've been in a hole researching all this. It's crazy. <laughs> well, various sources have accused Megan of using Kate's controversy as kind of a way to boost her new business. Um, what are people thinking about that? Yeah, so there's two sides of the story. So British media outlets and royal commentators like Kinsey Schofield are saying Megan is using Kate as a marketing ploy. But the other side of the spectrum is the American media outlets and a lot of American social media users are saying to leave Megan alone, let her run her business. It just happened to be at an inconvenient time for the royal family. Right. Exactly, Sophia. Other people are saying that Megan is reportedly reaching out to Kate through back channels because she's genuinely concerned about her health. But this is all speculation and no one knows if this is the truth or not. So I guess we'll just have to find out and see what happens. Oh, interesting. Wow. Well, thank you guys for being here. Of course. When we return, we'll get you ready for March Madness with a bracket breakdown. You won't want to miss it. a little horse. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. 
Why couldn't the pelican... Wait. Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because the players kept dribbling all over it. Where did cows go on vacation? New York. <laughs> Welcome back, Unpeelers. After a jam-packed championship week, March Madness came a little early. But the real big dance starts tomorrow with under 36 hours before the game one tips off. Our sports reporter, Nathaniel Cunningham, is here to explain how to make the perfect March Madness bracket. Thanks, Lily. Each year, over 60 million people fill out a March Madness bracket with the goal of getting all 63 games correct. Now, has that ever happened? The answer is no, and that's because the odds are about one in every 1.47 quintillion. So with your odds very slim, let me give you some advice on how to get the job done. Now, never look at this bracket as a whole. Always look at it in a piece. So let's take a look at one quarter. Each quarter is split based by region. So we'll take a look at the South. You can see teams ranked one through 16, which were chosen by the selection committee. They do that in each region. The one seeded teams are better than the 16 seeded teams. So if you went off rankings, the better seed should always win. But that's not always the case. I want you to take a look at this graphic that March Madness's Instagram put out just a couple of days ago. You could see that the first round, the higher seed typically wins. But I want you to take a look all the way at the bottom. The ninth seed has actually beaten the eight seed more times than they haven't. So how do you choose which teams to go for? I look at a graph of pace versus net rankings called the trapezoid of excellence. This is a graph of how quickly teams play versus how difficult their schedule was. Every single March Madness winner for the last decade has fallen within that trapezoid at the top. So when I'm making my picks to go with, I'm gonna go with that team right there, the Auburn Tigers to win it all. Now, I may not get every game right, but if you go with the teams that are closest to that trapezoid, you should see some success. Charlie, I know the madness of March is about to start, but I heard something crazier happen in reality TV. Definitely, Nate, and this is definitely crazier than beating one in quintillion odds, as you mentioned. Now, if you loved all the craziness of season six of Love is Blind, the reunion certainly didn't, didn't disappoint. Let's dive right into the drama with our reality TV reporter, Isabella Galan. Isabella, so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so ready to talk about this reunion. Absolutely. And well, I know the show is all about surprises. It's all different. Yes. But tell me, what made this reunion different than previous seasons? Well, I must say that Netflix definitely listened to the fans and made this reunion have so much more drama than usual. And But before I go into all that, I want to celebrate the one couple that was able to make it out of this season, which was Amy and um, Johnny. They were the only couple to get married, which is kind of crazy in my opinion, but so happy for them. They were such a strong couple from the beginning. But going into the drama a little bit, Something that was definitely also very shocking in this reunion was that they brought out Sarah Ann and Jeremy and they announced that they're actually dating now, which is crazy because Sarah Ann was actually the one that ended up breaking up Jeremy and um, Laura in their original pairing. So that was pretty crazy that they brought her out. And even though Laura couldn't be there for the actual reunion, they made sure that we got to see their confrontation by having a Zoom call with her. So they made sure that we got to see all that heat for sure. Wow, that must have been a wild Zoom Zoom call and yeah. well with all the couples you mentioned let's talk about some other couples did any couples clear the air with their drama right so in um, before the reunion started there was a lot of drama about um, if certain people came into the show for the right reasons and one of the big people that we, everyone was talking about was Trevor and they definitely brought him to the reunion as well as his text receipts with his previous um, girlfriend. And it was really, really crazy when they brought it out. He, he did not expect it at all, was totally blindsided. And he honestly had nothing to say. He sat there silently, which was pretty, pretty crazy. And even though he had nothing to say, when he did muster up something to say, it didn't really make any sense at all. So he even asked to leave, which has never happened before at the reunion. Yeah, well, that's pretty awful having your text being read out loud yeah. to everybody. And well, was anybody at the reunion besides the people of the season six cast? Yeah, they actually did a brand new thing for the reunion. They brought in previous cast members from Love is Blind and previous couples, which I thought was a really, really sweet touch. But something even bigger was that they announced season two of Perfect Match. So I'm definitely very excited to watch that, including some Love is Blind um, alumni. 
All right, that's our reality TV reporter, Isabel Gallant. Thank you so much. And after the break, we're talking about a television crossover nobody saw coming. We'll be back in two minutes. Did you hear about the pony with a sore throat? He was a little horse. <laughs> Can I tell you a cat joke? Just kidding. <laughs> Why couldn't the pelican? Wait. Why was the basketball court all wet? Why? Because the players kept dribbling all over it. Where the cats go on vacation? New York. <laughs> They call me Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham, bam, minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five. The seventh season of 911 premiered last Thursday. Plenty of hype around the season centered around what's happening in a few weeks. Our TV reporter Ben Dietrich tells us all about how the show will cross over with another major HBC ABC series. Ben, great to have you here. Great to be here, Charlie. And now I stuttered on that because I'm just so excited for this crossover. A reality TV show mixing up with a scripted TV show. This has never been done before. How is this going to happen? Yeah, so season five of the current season of 911 is going to cross over with none other but The Bachelor. People Magazine last week teased a photo of an ambulance from 911 at The Bachelor Mansion. So this is huge news for the TV industry because you're taking scripted television where actors obviously play characters and reality television where actors play themselves and messing them together. There's a lot of different directions that this could go and to, to add on to that, some people already think that The Bachelor is really scripted anyway, so this crossover could only fuel those accusations. Yeah, well, you did mention that there's a lot of directions that people go in with this. Do you think there is a direction that's been set? What's the plot looking like? So as of right now, there's a couple of potential plot points. For one thing, there could be an emergency at the Bachelor Mansion, or some of the characters from 911 could be Bachelor contestants. One character in particular, Firefighter, Firefighter Buck, is always trying to impress women. So me personally, I think he would thrive in that scenario. But uh, one fan in particular actually shared her thoughts over a TikTok on how Buck could be incorporated into this. Let's take a listen. I feel like it could be fun for Buck because we've seen like Buck in situations where there's like reality TV before and he's like so excited to be like, yeah, look at me, I'm on camera. And everyone else is like, Buck. Um, so I'm excited to see what happens. So yeah, as of right now, a lot of fan speculation. ABC hasn't confirmed anything yet though. That Buck seems like a pretty cool guy, Ben. And well, looking into this further, I gotta ask, this is unprecedented. Has this happened before? So it's slightly familiar territory for 911. They did cross over with a spinoff show, 911 Lone Star, back in 2021. And in that episode, the firehouse from 911 helped out uh, Lone Star's firehouse, put out a wildfire. But in terms of meshing with a uh, reality show, this has not happened before. So that just adds to the excitement. It definitely is exciting. Thank you so much, Ben. And now, one hit wonders. And usually I've been coming back around and well, they're gone. Our music reporter, Riley Underwood, is telling us how one band is having an unlikely resurgence. 
Samande, the most influential band you've never heard of. The group split up in the 70s with minimal success, but now they have their own documentary with a story to tell. Samande was founded in South London, England in 1971. All seven original members were born in the Caribbean before immigrating to the UK. This background influenced their tropical calypso funk. However, because of Britain's racial tensions and a lack of interest in their style of music, Samande never gained any traction in England. But their first single, The Message, charted on the Billboard Top 100 in the United States. Because of this success, they toured the US with one of the most successful soul artists of the time, Al Green. In 1973, Samande made history as the first British band to headline the Apollo Theater in New York. Then the band returned to England and had no success. By 1975, Samande was done. The band broke up and faded out of memory. 15 years later, their music was back and bigger than ever. The Fugees, Wu-Tang Clan, and De La Soul all sampled their music. Samande had suddenly found itself on top, or underneath rather, the musical world. Samande became a staple of New York City funk. The unique sounds became the perfect stars of the rising hip-hop scene in New York City. In the past decade, the band has gotten back together. A new documentary, Getting It Back, The Story of Samande, was recently released. And this month, for the first time ever, they toured Australia and are scheduled for a tour around Europe in April, where they will revisit the same place where it all started, London, a month from today. Riley Underwood, Citrus TV's Unpeeled. Thank you, Riley. Well, award season just wrapped up and we are recapping everything you missed. Plus, we're hanging out, we're handing out rather, some awards of our own. You won't want to miss it. Welcome to my house. Lately, not my happy place. Everybody's pretty tired of each other. The parents were not themselves. My little brothers were morphing into small creatures. The walls were closing in. Clearly a case of too much family, too close, 24-7. And there's a lot of that going around right now. If this sounds like your house, try going someplace new. Yourlifeyourvoice.org. You'll find lots of ideas to help you handle the family stresses of being confined to close quarters. Yourlifeyourvoice.org. It might not get you out of the house, but it could help you find a little more breathing room. In big entertainment news, Jimmy Kimmel hosted the 96th annual Oscar ceremony for the fourth time in Los Angeles. Some big winners of the night included Emma Stone, who won Best Actress for her role in Poor Things, and Billie Eilish for Best Original Song in Barbie. This was both of their second Oscars. Oppenheimer was the big winner of the night with seven wins, including Best Actor, Best Director, and Best Picture, and Ryan Gosling rocked the stage with his performance of I'm Just Ken from Barbie. By the end of the song, the whole audience was up on their feet. The show marked the end of the awards season. And while awards season there ended, mm -hmm. I do want to bring in some honorable mentions of movies that didn't quite make the cut. First off, The Iron Claws handing mm -hmm. my metaphorical, is getting my metaphorical award. Mm -hmm. I think it was such a fantastic movie with plot lines. It's based on a tragic story about the world of pro wrestlers. It's a true story starring Zac Efron, and it just really was incredible. You gotta see it. I do, and I know anything that involves wrestling obviously probably piques your interest, so I, I should give it a watch just for your sake. Well, <laughs> I have to say, the one thing that got snubbed the biggest, in my opinion, was Barbie. I know there was a whole bunch of, you know, uh, talk about it a little while ago when it first came out, but I just don't understand how Greta Gerwig or Margot Robbie were not nominated. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I actually watched the movie on the plane, Barbie, mm -hmm. and I thought it was really fun. It was, yeah. like, super over the top, like, comic booky. Right. And I thought that made it really cool. Yeah, absolutely. They were nominated for some awards when it came to, like, costuming and stuff like that, but in the end, they did really only win Best Original Song, which is a beautiful song, so I'm excited about that. Were there any other, other movies that you wanted to see get awards? Yeah, it's obviously the Winnie the Pooh movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm outraged. I'm, like, so upset that that, that didn't get that? the award. It's the movie. Right, I know. Well... We'll see. Maybe next year. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, that is all the time we have with you tonight. 
Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to follow all of our socials on Unpeeled underscore Syracuse on Instagram and TikTok and Citrus TV on X. I'm Charlie Goldberg. And I'm Lily Evans. We'll see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m.